Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may happen to be on God's glorious earth. Welcome to Balance Point. As you can tell, we are doing another one of these recorded lessons. And this is actually going to be the way that we're going to be going for a while with Balance Point. As um, we want to concentrate more on the people side of ministry rather than the technology and the teaching side of ministry. And that's going to become our focus as we go into 2016. And so the Balance Point lessons are going to be recorded so that we can expend more time. <clears throat> Um, really just serving people. And so let us prepare our hearts for this, uh, this week's lesson. Father God, we welcome your presence. We ask, oh God, that you would magnify yourself that you would make your message known as we preach the word and we teach out of your precepts. Father God, magnify yourself in the name of your son Jesus. And everybody says, Amen. And amen. <clears throat> Today I may be just a little discombobulated as I'm teaching because, well, I'm not sitting at my regular computer with all of my regular stuff just ready to rock and roll. Um, in fact, I, I am teaching from my mobile computer and I'm actually using my uh, mobile Bible. And so, in, in fact, today, because of the way things have worked out I don't even have my regular notes with me and so this is literally going to end up being what God lays on my heart today but um, we have been looking at the gospel and this is actually the last in our four part series on the gospel and if you missed any of the parts those parts are available at our YouTube channel at uh, YouTube dot com slash users slash balance point church and there is actually a playlist the gospel and all of the videos are going to be there um, eventually I will get them all linked back to our uh, own web page which is www.bounce-point.org that's www.bounce-point.org but we've been looking at the gospel Last week we looked at <coughs> the burial of Christ and how his burial was according to the scriptures and how his burial applied to our lives and the lessons that we could take away from the burial of Christ. Today we are going to look at the resurrection of Christ. But what I want to do, if I can find my verse, because I'm, again, not using my Bible, my uh, regular program. Well, I'm using my regular program. I'm just not using it in a regular place. But our, our text for the last four weeks has been 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. I want to reread that for you. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news that I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was not true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important, and what had also been passed on to me. Christ 
died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. And he was seen by Peter and the twelve, and after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers. Father God, we thank you for this word, and we thank you for this good news. And as we embark on this study, we ask, Father God, that your word would go forth and it would do what you have designed for it to do. In the name of your son, Jesus, amen and amen. Now this week, we want to concentrate on the phrase, and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. What does it mean that he was raised from the dead? Well, it means just that. It means that after having been crucified, after having died, removed from the cross and buried, sometime on the third day after his burial, he was raised from the dead. Sometime... During the celebration of the Feast of First Fruits, and because of the way the Jewish calendar works and the Jewish calendar runs from sunset to sunset, he could have risen that Saturday night, according to our Roman calendar. Anytime from that Saturday night up until when the tomb was discovered to have been emptied, he rose from the dead. He literally got up from a grave and was seen to be alive. He was seen by the apostles, the eleven and then the following week by all twelve. He was seen first by the women who came to finish doing what was needful for his burial. He was seen by more than five hundred. And then he was seen in a vision by Paul. And he was seen physically, bodily. These were not some visions. I mean, people touched his body. In fact, on that first morning, when he appeared to the women, one of the women grabbed a hold of him. But, and she was holding on to him because she was so overjoyed at the fact that he had risen from the dead. And he had to tell her, let go, because I've not yet been glorified. He was seen to have been eating. And he was handled by the disciples. So he was raised from the dead. But what does that mean according to the scriptures? Well, the primary scripture, and there, there are actually two scriptures that point to him being raised from the dead. The first one Jesus gives us himself. When the scribes and the Pharisees came to him and they asked for a sign. And Jesus said, I will give you no sign other than <clears throat> the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. So the sign of Jonah, Jonah having been, and many scholars believe that Jonah was actually dead and God raised him as a prophet. And interestingly enough, as a prophet to the Gentiles. He wasn't even sent as a prophet to his own people. He was sent to the city of Nineveh. But then, but then we, we see his resurrection from the dead implied in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 10. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and to cause him good grief, cause him grief. 
Yet, when his life was made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. Now, understand, Isaiah here has already mentioned that the Messiah would be cut off and there'd be no descendants. There, there would be no Mrs. Messiah. There'd be no little Messiahlings, little Messiah Jr. And yet it says here that when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life when the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. In other words, it's, Isaiah has already spoken of his death. And now it's speaking of his eternal life, his eternal resurrection. And the offspring that he would have. Which brings us to the first point. Jesus' resurrection is important because it is by that resurrection that we become adopted into the family of God. We become adopted. Now, for most of us, while we understand the idea of adoption and all that, it, it, it isn't a strong narrative for us. And even for children who were adopted as infants, it may not be as strong of a narrative. But consider the child that's maybe eight, nine, ten years old. And they, they've had, shall we say, less than a prosperous life. Maybe they've bounced from foster home to foster home. Maybe they've experienced abuse, neglect, rejection. And then to have a family open up their home to them, to the child. And to have that family not only open up their home, but open up their hearts. And to invite that child into their family. Not as a foster child. Not as a, a temporary alien. But as a permanent forever home. You know, people who, who, who deal in pet adoptions, you know, talk about giving a pet a forever home. Well, how much more than a pet are we to God? And God says, I'm going to pay the price for you. So you can have a forever home. A forever home with me. And God doesn't do this when we're like a little child where, you know, we're kind of cute and lovable. You know, it's easy to see adoption <clears throat> of a child because, you know, children are, you know, for the most part, cute and lovable. But God does this when we're low down, dirty down, unlovable, rebellious sinners. And he does this so that we might be called his children, the sons and the daughters of the Most High God. We who are rejected, we who were used by Satan, by the devil, in his hatred of God, he has used you, he has used me. As a means to get back at God. And we went along with his plans willingly. And then God comes along and says, I love you. God comes along and he says, I desire you. I will love you with an everlasting love. And we... That, that, that little bit of the image of God that remains in the depraved man begins to resonate with the love of the Father. Begins to 
resonate. And as we gain that energy from God, because none of us will come to God on our own. It's all God's idea. It's all God's work. It's all God's purpose. But as that power, the power of love, the power of grace, resonates with the little bit of an image that's left in us, and we come to say, yes, yes, God, yes. That's what the resurrection buys us. The resurrection gives us a glimpse of what is to come. That's right, the resurrection gives us a glimpse of what is to come. It doesn't come through in the English in the first Corinthians chapter, but in the Greek, the phrase, and he was raised from the dead, it's in the present perfect, if I remember correctly. What I do remember about that verb is that it is a statement of the ongoing condition of the resurrection. In other words, Jesus was raised from the dead as a man. And as a man, he is still raised from the dead. In other words, the amazing thing is that not only did God become man, but there is a man ruling the universe. Because when Jesus was raised, when Christ came up out of that grave, he did not set aside his humanity. He did not set aside what it meant to be a man. He, didn't, he did not set aside his human nature. Rather, he was raised as a man. He ascended into heaven as a man, and he is glorified as a man. And what that tells us is that gives us a glimpse of the future of mankind. We have a future ahead of us that we are going to be raised from the dead. In a sense, we already are raised from the dead because if we have participated in the death of Christ, in the crucifixion of Christ, if we have been crucified with Christ, we have already been raised and we have been seated in the heavenly realms. So we have already been raised from the dead. And, and, and we even see that in our own lives. I mean, think about this. When you came to trust in Jesus. You were still you. And while the old man, while the old woman that was you died, and it died in the spiritual, but it, it died, the one that was raised, the new you, for the time being at least, is still carried in the old container. Now, there will come a day when the container will even be changed. But the spiritual you, the you that is your heart, the you that is the center of your being, was resurrected. The you as God meant you to be was resurrected. And it was changed. You see, when we go to heaven, we aren't going to be a bunch of uh, disembodied spirits floating around in the heavenly realms. No, we're going to be people. We're going to be men and women. We're going to be 
the chosen of God. We, we, we are going to be there physically. I don't understand what all that means and how all that works out. What I do understand is that we will enjoy physical bodies when we have been raised from the dead. When on that day when he calls forth those who are in the grave and those who are yet alive, will be changed. The third thing, besides giving us a glimpse of the possible future, and this is especially important for those who don't know the Lord Jesus yet, who have never trusted in him yet, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead gives us hope. You see, if there's no resurrection from the dead, if we have believed in a bunch of false fairy tales, then when we die, that's it. We wink out of existence, a perfectly good waste of life, a perfectly good waste of knowledge. It's just a waste. If we have believed on Jesus and, and it's a false hope, a false belief, then we're to be pitied. On the other hand, if this is true, if what Jesus has done is true for us, then you know what? The resurrection of Jesus is hope. Because it means that death is not the final door, but rather death is the opening curtain. It means that death isn't the final prison, but rather death is the gateway to eternal life. And there is hope. You see, without the resurrection of Jesus, there's no hope. Without the resurrection of Jesus, it's just you live, you die, you're gone. It's over. And that's if that that's if those who don't accept an afterlife are correct. You just die and you turn to dust, you turn into worm food, and it's a done deal. If the Bible is correct and we die without Jesus, we die without trusting that God would take care of us then it's even worse than, than the atheist point of view. Because without Jesus, we're in sin. And if we're in sin, we're deserving of death. And if we're deserving of death, death we shall have. We will have eternal separation from the Father. And so, Jesus' resurrection gives us hope. It gives us hope. It gives us a glimpse of the future. It gives us adoption. Best of all, <clears throat> the resurrection of Jesus points to peace. It points to to peace. What do I mean it points to peace? Well, without the resurrection of Jesus, without the death of Jesus and the burial of Jesus, without the good news of what Jesus has done, we would still be at war with God. There would be no peace. There would be no hope. There would be no joy. But the resurrection points to peace with God. Because it shows that the payment that Jesus made was complete. 
It shows that the payment that Jesus made satisfied the requirements of God. Satisfied the, the righteous justice of God. And meant that we would not have to experience the wrath of God. But the resurrection of Jesus also gives us peace within ourselves. And it shows that we have the ability to be forgiven. And our conscience can be at rest. So the resurrection points to peace. It points to a hope. It points to our future. It gives us adoption. Let us pray. Father God, we just ask, that your word would just bless us deeply, completely. That, Father God, this good news would be good news of hope, of peace, of joy, of adoption. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for this time of learning. Now, Father God, we just pray for those who have heard this message. That they receive it with great joy. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. You know, if you have never trusted in the name of Jesus, if you've never trusted that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, today you can put your trust in him. And it is as simple as confession. Word says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus, that God rose him from the dead, and you will confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. What is belief? Belief is nothing but trust. If you're listening to this, you're trusting that the technology would deliver the signal to you. You know how to trust. What's confession? <clears throat> Confession is to say the same thing about ourselves that God has said about us. And what has God said? First thing he said is he loves you. He loves you and he loves me. Second thing he said is we make mistakes. We blow it. When we blow it, it's called sin. The third thing he says is there's a debt to be paid for the sin. But you can't afford it. And the fourth thing that God says is, I'll pay it for you. This isn't cheap grace. It costs God everything. It costs Jesus his life. It costs the Father his Son. But it's free grace to you and me. And all we have to do is trust and confess. So if you've never trusted in the name of Jesus, that he died for you. Or maybe you once did, but you walked away from it. Today you can come back. And all you got to do is pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for loving me. Father, I know that I sin, I make mistakes, and I fall down all the time. Forgive me. Thank you for sending your son to pay the debt that I can't pay. Thank you for cleansing me of all of my sins. I accept that gift. Now, send your Holy Spirit that I might <clears throat> be guided by him. That I might live for you through the rest of my life. In the name of your son Jesus who died for me. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, God bless you. And we want to hear from you. 
And to hear from you, all you got to do is just contact us at our, at our email address, staff at bouncehpoint.org. Put in the subject line, new believer. Because the word says something else. <clears throat> that if you will acknowledge me before man, I will acknowledge you before God. That's what Jesus says. And I'm a man. And, you know, because we do these things online and because we do a lot of things at a distance, you know, we don't have you raise your hand unless you're in our virtual sanctuary. And we have a little card that you can, we have a little electronic card that you can raise your hand with. But you, you can still acknowledge Jesus by just shooting us that email at staff at bounce-point.org. I'll agree with you. This isn't about joining a church. This is about acknowledging the Lordship of Jesus in our lives. Now, we do have regular Sunday worship. And we meet in Central L.A. County, and you can just contact us at that same address, staff at bounce-point.org. Tell me that you want to come to the worship service. We worship Sunday evenings at 7 p.m. And all you do is shoot me an email. I'll get you the information about how to get to us. If you're a little bit further out, you can, you can worship with us online. 7 o'clock at our uh, sanctuary at bounce-point.churchonline.org. Bound-point.churchonline.org. Join us. You'll love it. Last but not least, if you don't have a church, you really should belong to a church. And this isn't about, you know, building our kingdom, but it's about building you up. Because the church is given to build you up so you can go do the work of the Lord. And we would love to have you as part of the Balance Point family. And becoming part of the Bounce Point family is as simple as registering at our ministry center with a real email address so we can contact you. We will go over what we believe, why we believe, how we do things. And if we can come to an agreement as a family, you'll be welcomed into the Bounce Point family. You'll be given the opportunity to join the Bounce Point community. And all you have to do is just register. Now, a little reminder for those of you that are in countries that do this daylight savings time thing. Here in America, this coming Sunday, November 1st, we fall back. So we will be back on standard time. Don't forget to change your clocks back Saturday night before you go to bed. But we will still be online and, and still worshiping on Sunday at 7 o'clock Pacific time. And y'all are welcome to join us. Also, starting next week, we are starting a new series. The series is called Radical Love. We're going to take the next few weeks through the end of the year, and we are going to examine what it means to love radically. What does God's kind of love look like? So be sure to join us for over the next few weeks because it's going to be a power-filled time. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. And now in the name of the Father, who loved us to the point of the death of his Son, and in the name of the Son, who is glorified by bringing us into adoption as children of the King, and to the Holy Spirit who strengthens us and guides us in all truth, go in the grace and the peace of your Father in heaven. Amen and amen.